Oh, actually, we're live. I forgot to do the countdown. Okay. You know, it's one of those nights. <laughs> so we're already live. Oh, wait, wait. 30, 29, 28, 29. <laughs> oh, well, I pressed the wrong button. So we're live already. So we'll Yay. just waste a couple of seconds to wait, you know, for people to get notified. <laughs> Is it Monday, <laughs> Helen? I just don't even know. <laughs> no, it's Wednesday, but it feels very Monday-ish. It, it, it yes. does oh, it feel goodness. a little Monday-like today. Well, I am glad you are here with me tonight. And for those of you just joining us now live, if you um, don't remember, uh, Helen is the featured expert for March. She is the owner of No Monkey Business Dog Training, as well as Old Dogs Go to Helen. Um, and we've got a great, a great conversation for you tonight. Um, if you've been kind of listening in over the last couple of months, we've been having listening sessions on a dog training methodology where we were listening to your beliefs and your questions and your ideas. All of that information um, was summarized and um, given to uh, several of our dog training partners, Helen included, and we had a dog training panel discussion to address some of the concerns that came up. And then Helen is kind of the end of that couple of months discussion. Um, and tonight we're going to kind of talk about the tough conversations as it relates to dog training, um, things that maybe people are uncomfortable talking about or are not sure how they should talk about it. Um, you know, Helen's been in the business over 20 years and she's seen it all. From what I can tell, Helen, you have seen it all. Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> so um, we're going to kind of round out this great conversation that we've started here over the last couple months with Helen um, giving her her our opinions, um, her opinions, her stories, her tips, her best practices. Um, so we're going to jump into it tonight with her and with you guys. And um, we encourage you to ask your questions if you have them. Um, and, you know, no question is off limits. We just ask everybody to be polite, obviously, with um, this discussion and with your questions. Um, you know, Helen has been in the business a very long time. She's got a crap ton of letters after her name. So she alphabet has, soup. Exactly. Alphabet soup after her name, um, as do most of our dog training partners. So um, I'm looking forward to getting into this, Helen, because I think this is going to be really valuable for everybody. And before we get started, I'm just going to pop up a link here because um, what Facebook does is they don't actually show us your name when we're streaming through StreamYard. Mm -hmm. You can see other people's names if you comment on the platform, but because we're in StreamYard, we don't see your name unless you give permission um, to StreamYard for us to do that. So you go to StreamYard.com slash Facebook. That means we can address you personally, which is always nice, versus it just saying Facebook user. So um, if you're comfortable doing that, fantastic. If you're not, um, that's no sweat um, as well. Um, you do whatever you're comfortable with, but we'd like to be able to address you by name. So Helen, before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about your expertise and what you do at No Monkey Business Dog Training? Oh God. Um, so I do, you know, I'm, I'm a family dog trainer. Um, I've trained dogs with, well, I hate, I'm we're going to talk about the word dog training, but I help the everyday human with the everyday dog. Let's just put it that way. I don't focus a ton on sports um, or anything like that. I really work with clients from puppyhood or pre pre puppy, pre bringing a dog home all the way puppy through adulthood and now into seniorhood. I, I specialize myself in behavior modification, a lot of reactivity, aggression, anxiety, but the gamut of like how to live with your dog happily in today's world, basically. Um, and I've never really strayed far from that path, but my um, way of looking at that, what I looked at and how I've done that has definitely shifted and, and molded itself over the last 20 years. But I've always really stayed focused to, um, you know, family dogs. Well, I love how you said in today's world, because I remember a webinar, I think you did it last year, on kind of the evolution of dogs and their place in the home, their place, you know, on the farm, their place in the lives with humans. Um, it was really, really eye-opening. And um, if you are one of our members and you have not listened to that, um, I encourage you to go to the library and look that up. That was really a great conversation with, uh, it was a slide presentation, um, lots of great information to kind of help your thinking um, and understanding with where, you know, wh where dogs have come, come over many, 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 many years. 
So Helen, let's let's get right into it. Um, the the first question I have for you is is really kind of an interesting one, and I've you know over the conversations we've had in our community since December, um, I really feel that dog training is kind kind of becoming a dirty word. And yeah. I'm curious what you're hearing about that, what you're seeing, and any suggestions you might have for changing the conversation. Okay, so this that's a, a great. Um, I mean, let's let's go back just even a step to that question, you know, before that question in terms of um, where I, I want to just broach really quickly of where my experience is coming from and when I answer that question so that people kind of understand the perspective that they're seeing here. So when I first started training, I was working with shelter dogs. My, my main career was um, in the shelter. However, prior to that in college, I had gotten my very first dog. Um, I'd been bitten by the dog but I, bu bug. I didn't grow up with them, but I'd gotten my first dog and I took him to a dog training class. And this was my very first experiences like working with my dog in that arena. And he was a Papillon. So I don't know and anyone who knows Papillon knows that they're like literally fluffy guinea pigs with big ears at that age. Right. And he was jumping up at my feet. And when he was jumping up at my feet, the instructor came over and said to me, you know, when he jumps up at you like that, the best way to stop that is to step on his back feet so that it, it hurts him. So he'll stop jumping on you. And, you know, I really didn't know a ton about behavior or anything at that point. I just knew that it didn't sit right with me and I didn't want to do that. And I picked up my dog Merlin and I said, I'm not feeling very well. You know, thank you all. I'll, I'll see you later. And I left and I never went back. Um, anyway, then I ended up in Colorado working with shelter dogs and I learned a ton about what you can and can't do when you don't have a relationship with the dog that you're working with, right? Because when you work with a shelter dog that really has no, the only interest they have in working with you is maybe what can they gain from it, but not like relationship based. And then at the same time, my husband at the time in Colorado was looking to become a police canine officer. And so we were going down the road of learning about all about canine training, police canine training. And while I was doing the shelter work with also just like literally multifaceted, lots of different arenas of learning about behavior and training. I didn't sort of start in one specific spot, if that makes sense. So to sort of round out, and, and that's where you're saying like, I've seen it all. I've, I've been in all of these arenas. You know, dog training to me today, the word dog training, has turned into this very dominion um egotistical word or phrase for me and and it's it's something i struggle with myself i am a dog trainer but a lot of my work is not training the dog like i'm not i barely at this point in consultations i very rarely actually demonstrate with the dog i'm actually talking more to the client and to yeah. the humans um and I feel like I'm more of a dog mediator or an advocate rather than a trainer, you know, and I and I think back to if you've ever watched, you know, Blackfish, the documentary about, um, you know, SeaWorld and the orcas that were kept and the trainers that were asked to train these, um, you know, captive or orcas to do these, you know, behaviors to get these um, you know, crowds to pay the tickets. And sometimes I will, I have felt like as a dog trainer, I'm kind of doing that, you know, teaching these dogs to do these behaviors, to meet the needs of human expectations, but that don't actually function for the dog, um, dog's long-term well-being, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah. you know, like does go to, does dog learning to go to their mat and stay for three or four hours, for a length, length of time or forcing a dog to go to a parade or in, in, in be involved in all of this stuff, who, who am I teaching that behavior for? Am I teaching it for the dog to improve their quality of life or am I teaching it because the human wants that? And so this, this idea of dog training has in many ways turned into this kind of ugly phrase because it can feel very sort of like I'm better, I'm training this lower level species, if that makes sense. But I, mm. but I'm, I go back to the idea. I, I very much thought about changing even the name of my business because my business says no monkey business dog training. And I'm like, eh. um, but I go back to the good that 
the intentional good that comes from that phrase, it still in many ways outweighs what it can mean in a bad way. So I still will say, yeah, I'm a dog trainer. I do, I do still train dogs. I train my own dogs. I've just taken a lot bigger role in advocating that the behaviors that I'm training or the things and skills that I'm training are more focused on the dog's long-term well-being than the meeting the needs of the human. So I think we could still use the word dog training if we start to shift even ever so slightly our actual focus on what are we doing with dogs today. Yeah, a lot of good points there. And one thing I want to highlight a little bit more that you said in the very beginning um, of the conversation was um, when you were at your first training class um, with your dog and, um, you know, they were asking you to step on the feet and it didn't sit right with you. That right there, that that aching you know, feeling in your gut. You got to listen to that. That's so, so valuable for people. And some of the things that I find, I'll be curious (coughs) what you think about this is, you know, maybe you're a first time um, dog uh, guardian and obviously you want to do training. Everybody says you have to do training, you know, for whatever reason, whatever your goals are. And um, you are working with someone who you trust, um, who you, uh, feel is professional, has the right education, certification, licensure, whatever, to be telling you these uh, things to teach your dog, yet if it doesn't sit right with you, and if you know we're in an unregulated industry and my, you know, plumber could hang out a shingle and say that they're a dog trainer, Mm -hmm. um, I think you really have got to listen to that gut feeling. And I guess any advice you can give to people on the path that people would follow to figure out, okay, what sits right with me and what's right for me and my dog? Well, I mean, this is where I think having a, having that actual conversation with your trainer is imperative. You know, if you are feeling uncomfortable about something and, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, when, when that happened with Merlin, when they told me to step on his feet, I was in the middle of a big group class and, and I was, you know, it was like, this is not good. And I left, but there are now opportunities, much more opportunities than there were then. I mean, this was like 23 years ago that this happened. It wasn't like I had the opportunity to text my trainer or email at that time. It was sort of like you show up, you do it and you leave type of thing. But nowadays, what I would say is reach out and ask, say, this makes me uncomfortable. And can you explain why? Because what can happen is if you go down the wormhole of social media, or you go down the wormhole of Google, or you go down, like, again, it's not a standardized industry. So you can get so many differing opinions very, very quickly that will all contradict each other. And that can actually leave you more confused. And, you know, I'll give an example. Like, I hate flying. I hate flying. Every time I get on an airplane in my gut, (laughs) I'm like, I should not be 18,000 feet above sea level. Like this isn't natural, right? If I followed my gut in that instinct, I'd never go anywhere, right? Sometimes, (laughs) sometimes your gut will be not that you shouldn't always like shouldn't listen to it, but sometimes your gut may go, Oh, I'm not sure about this. And maybe you're not sure about it because you don't understand it or you don't know enough about it. And maybe having that conversation, opening the door for your trainer to say, well, yeah, let me explain that to you. That's a great question. And give you that example will ease your mind. And that to me is the first step. And then if you end up with a trainer that goes, I don't have to answer that, and I'm not going to answer that, and I have nothing else to say to you, then that's a much clearer picture for me in terms of, all right, my gut is right here. But I've had so many clients that have said to me, I don't, can you explain this to me? What is this for? Why am I doing this? What, you know, all of that. And like, that's my job is to say, well, okay, I totally get it. I didn't know this stuff once too. So let's talk about this. And then they are much more informed. And then if they want to go down the road of Google, at least then they've given the trainer the opportunity to have that kind of conversation. And so my first recommendation is talk to your trainer, be open minded and, and candid. And, and if they aren't that in return, that's your answer. 
Yeah, I would agree. And advocating for your dog is so key. I mean, we find that on adventures as well. If, you know, you're a little bit nervous, there's somebody walking next to you, their dog is getting a little too close, or you feel the guardian isn't really keeping track of, of where they are, speak up. That's okay. I mean, we encourage co communication and conversations among people. Um, and we educate people at the beginning of our events to be open to those conversations, because that's the only way people are going to learn. That's the only way we're going to be able to practice that skill set of building that confidence and advocating for their dog. So it leads me to the next question for you is how important do you feel it is to meet people where they are in their dog training journey and kind of help them learn and take them to where you think they're trying to get to? Well, I think that that's a, a very big missing piece sometimes in this industry, right? Um, and that's more talking to other dog trainers than it is to talking to the public. But to me, it is so important that the people that walk into my office do not feel that they have anything to hide, that they have anything that they are going to be judged on. I mean, I've had people that will say to me, you know, I know you're probably going to tell me that it's wrong, but I let them sleep on the bed with me. And I'm like, so <laughs> like, or they'll be afraid to zoom with me because their house is a mess. Right. Or they won't bring their dog in. They're scared to come in because their dog is on a certain tool and they don't, you know, or, or it will slip out in the middle of a conversation. And I can tell that they're like, Oh God. And you know, that automatically is going to set the stage for there not being a, a proper way forward for the animal because we're not, we haven't laid all the cards out on the table. Okay. So for me, I meet the people where they're at with what they have in a completely non judgmental way. The most important thing for me is, you know, I, and I will say this to them I don't, I don't have to live with this dog. You do. And my job is to help you as much as I possibly can so that you can help your dog. So we have to be open to, you know, meeting them. I've, I've had so many clients that have come from places that they have felt shamed for, or they have felt, you know, ridiculed or, um, you know, and, and this happens a lot with dog trainers, but it also can happen with the public too. I mean, I'll never forget. I was out once and I was working with my own dog and he was doing amazing. I mean, you wouldn't know that he had had some reactivity because I was working with him so much and I was treating him. And this guy walked past and goes, hey, dogs can get fat, keep feeding them all his food. And I mean, luckily for me, I'm like, hey, whatever, buddy. You know, I know what I'm doing. But the average person that hears that is going to feel like, oh, God, maybe I shouldn't or, you know, yeah. maybe this or maybe that. And uh, so there's enough of that. Where I know out in the real world, people are getting judged for everything. So you shouldn't feel that way when you walk into a dog training space. And that that's... That's how I try to, that's how we at No Monkey Business try to do it. And I know that there are a lot of trainers still trying to do that too. Yeah. And I'm glad you bring that up because I hear it a lot. Like um, <clears throat> it could be things like, you know, you're, you're not feeding your dog enough or you're not feeding your dog enough of the right stuff or you're exercising your too dog too much or you're not exercising your dog enough. You got to add canine enrichment, you know, don't do too much physical enrichment if they are reactive, don't walk them because they're not going to have be a good experience. I mean, I don't even know, you know, I'm not a dog trainer and I don't even know how people just are able to exist in the space with all the messages um, that are coming. The to noise. Them. It's yeah, noise. The noise. Exactly. It's like, how do you filter that out? I mean, I'd like to say that belonging to this community helps, but I'm a little biased. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's true. It's, it, and that's, you know, what, what I really love is I say to clients, like you, I want you to have a little mini me on your shoulder, you know, where you feel that you can say, well, if Helen were here, this is probably what she would say to me. And that's my goal. By the time you're done with my classes, that you'll have this little me on your shoulder and the most non-creepy way possible that will say to you like, no, it's, it's okay that you're feeding right now, you know? Um, and that's great that that dog is doing that sport, but your dog doesn't have to do that sport. And that dog right. can go on a walk, but your dog can't, or your dog can go on a walk and that dog can't. And that's okay. Like every dog and, and human case is, is as individual as a fingerprint that we each have and snowflake, you know? So it, it, everything is, is a case by case basis. I agree. 
Well, let's move on to the next question here. And if anybody listening has a question, um, let us know. If you're listening on the replay, feel free to ask your question still. We'll make sure that gets to Helen. As I mentioned, she is the featured expert for March. So she'll be checking in with us and um, we'll be making sure that we get everybody's questions answered. So Helen, how about this? So how do you educate and convince dog owners of the benefits of positive reinforcement, especially those who have been conditioned to believe in other training strategies? Oh, that's a great question. And I just I, like, as you're asking me that I'm going through like my filing system of all the people that have come in with this idea in their head of the way that they are supposed to train or the way that they used to train or what they thought and then have shifted that view and sort of how did we do that? And basically the way that we've done it or that I do it is I just say like, can we just try this? Like, will you just give me the benefit of the doubt? It, I promise you nothing is going, it's not going to hurt anything by trying this. Will you just try this? And that's been one of the quickest ways to snowball the effect of the client going, oh my God, the dog is offering these behaviors and he's happy to do it, or he's being much more consistent with them. And um, I'm not having to get an ick feeling in my stomach sometimes anymore. I feel better and I can tell the dog feels better. And so those kinds of things have made the, you know, a huge difference. The the hard part sometimes can be that a lot of our responses, our conditioned strategies, you know, like if we talk about the old school leash pop, like I have a lot of clients who are just conditioned when the dog does something they don't, they they just, they can't help themselves. Um, and I'll say, no, no, we don't have to do that. And that's where, you know, we have the hands-free hitch, put the dog's leash on a hitch and train without holding a leash. And you have to free yourself of not being able to do that stuff anymore. Like you don't have the opportunity to do that. And and sometimes even doing, you know, leash free training where we no, you don't you, we're going to work without a leash right now. And that way you don't have the opportunity to to fall back on those old you know, habits that a lot of people don't even realize they're doing. They've done it for so long with their last dog. And I mean, listen, this is the same with all of us, right? We go into a new bedroom where we've just renovated and the light switch used to be on one side and now it's on the other. And we just can't help ourselves, but go to that old light switch. And sometimes you really just have to take that ability away. And so taking the leash away and showing them and say, can we just try this? has usually worked well in my favor. Not always. I've had some clients that have said, no, I, I like it the other way. And I have to say, oh, okay, you know, then this isn't, this isn't going to work. Um, you know, but, but thankfully I would say about 95% of the time they're like, wow, cheese is amazing. <laughs> and I'm like, I know. Right. So yep. it does work pretty well. Well, and what I like to see and encourage people to do is just have an open mind to conversations. Uh, yes. You believe what you believe, but there's always new science. There's new technology. You know, and I think a lot of what we've learned too comes from our parents, our grandparents who had dogs. Um, <clears throat> Dakota's turning 15 tomorrow and certainly how we started our dog training journey is nowhere near what we understand and practice with her today, primarily because of my work with the, you know, the Golden Dog Adventure Company and all of our wonderful partners. Um, but, you know, my parents have their own belief system. My grandmother had her own belief system, um, you know, and obviously that's passed down. And, uh, you know, people just have to, again, with that gut feeling, does this feel right? You know, have I done my research? Have I talked to a, a trainer? Um, you know, what's the latest science? And I think, again, just being open minded to conversations um, can be one of the most helpful things you can do for yourself and for the well-being of your dog. And I mean, even for argument's sake, you can say that the even the expectations that our grandparents had on our dog for dogs, you know, or is especially our great grandparents. I mean, dogs did not have the expectation of companionship the way that they do and they have in the last 15 years. Like the dog training industry has shifted so dramatically because 
people are leaning on dogs and their their animals so much more the way that they didn't when we are for our, our grandparents and even our parents you know the dog was just kind of there they you know you fed them and they hung out and a lot of them lived out when you had people over you just put the dog outside you know it just wasn't so sometimes when you explain that to a client, like, yeah, okay, the way that you used to train might have suited the way that we looked at dogs then, but we don't look at dogs that way anymore. We don't ask that of our dogs anymore. We ask for all these things. So we might have to shift the way that we're working with them, certainly in a different way. And and sometimes that can help. Yep. Agreed. Um, So we have a question from one of our listeners. Um, Do you always use positive reinforcement for your training? Yes. I mean, I start with reward-based training. So reward-based training is positive reinforcement. I I am a huge advocate for reinforcing a dog for doing the right thing, okay? And the human as well. But I don't stay in just positive reinforcement. That means that there are four main quadrants for it. So that means that if there has to, if there's a a way to say to the dog, that's not okay. Um, in a way that is not painful, stressful, fear inducing or anything like that. I'm absolutely comfortable in having those conversations, but no matter what in, a, I will never start and only work with a dog in a negative light, if that makes sense. Like it, it's always balanced with the, the positive reinforcement. And that's the, that's the, the main part of my my work is is reinforcing the dog and the human for the good choices that they're making. One of the things that we found too that was interesting to me, but made a lot of sense um, when we had our dog training uh, panel discussion, is that many of our partners had actually started in different um, working in, with different philosophies of training because when they got into the business, that's what the latest science showed was working. So they've tried a number of different techniques and strategies, and I'm assuming that you have as well. Yeah, I mean, from working with shelter dogs, police canines, um, you know, horses, and and I mean, literally my spouse, I mean, any creature (laughs) across the board, we found that positive reinforcement and reward-based training is the most effective way to get those behaviors really moving and actually stick and have the dog or the animal learn those behaviors more, you know, concretely. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, you look, I look now like, you know, I did a lot of bite sports with my, my Belgian um, Aslan. And, you know, I went to a canine trainer for him and they, they have progressed so dramatically in terms of their use of food and the clicker and all of this stuff. Like it's, it's been a really big movement. I think the hard part has become that it's become that if you do anything outside of just that, then you're abusive. And that's where that tough conversation and that part, those people feel like, oh God, if I say no, if I, if, you know, if, Positive does not have to mean permissive. And that's something that I talk a lot about with clients. Wonderful. Well, thank you, um, Nancy. I know uh, this is one of our first. So thank you, Nancy, for that question. I appreciate it. So here's another one. Um, From your perspective, what are the long-term impacts on a dog's behavior and logical well-being when trained primarily with positive reinforcement compared to more aversive methods? a great question. I mean, I basically ask people the same thing, right? Like, have you ever worked for anybody who you felt threatened by in terms of like, if I don't do this, the right thing, they're going to come down on me again, or they're always coming after me because I spelt this wrong, or I did this wrong on a report, or I didn't do this right. Like, and you just, it builds and builds and builds over time, you know, Um, versus if you've ever worked with someone who has really fostered what you wanted to learn and supported you and reinforced you and given you a gift card because you showed up 10 minutes early one day and like, you're like, this is great. I'm really motivated. And I mean, it's the same with our animals. You know, the long-term effects is that you have a relationship with the animal that is not just, I mean, that's the thing that people worry about with lots of rewards. And when you use food, is, is he just doing it for the food? Well, sometimes at first, yes, he might be. But what he's also gaining in that is this trust and this really fun 
um, experience that he's getting with you, that that builds a foundation over time that, you know, there are there's communications that I can have with my dogs where I don't even have to say anything. I don't have to have food, but they're like, oh yeah, I know what you need because we're in sync. And that doesn't happen um, in my experience with dogs and animals that have been primarily trained with aversive and punitive methods. Okay. And so I'm looking for the relationship and the long-term goal of the human and the animal, not just the immediate short-term result. Yeah, that was a great analogy um, that you gave and uh, somebody commented to that effect too. And I know being a mother yourself, um, you mm -hmm. know, we've both grown kids, we've both grown dogs. Uh, I feel a lot of parallels there with the training methods you might use with kids that you also use um, with dogs. And, you know, I, I'd like to think I have a very good relationship with my boys and a lot of what I did with them bringing them up was to treat them as a human being and not necessarily just as a child to give them choices and to help them learn from their mistakes. Do you feel that there's some parallels that you've used between what you do with your children and, and potentially what you do with dogs? Yeah. With dogs, I use cheese. And with the kids, I use just use M&Ms. <laughs> no, that's I'm the best stuff. <laughs> no. Um, yes, of course. And it's the same thing. It's like, you know, I am extremely positive and reward based with my kids. Great choice. Let me give you options, you know, but there are absolutely times where I say, no, we're not doing that right now. And you need to be respectful of my boundaries. But that also means that I'm respectful of their boundaries. When they say no to me, I listen. It's a, it's a relationship based, you know, of communication. And it's exactly the same, in my opinion, whether I'm working with my my dogs, whether I'm working with horses, whether I'm working with cats or parrots, whatever I'm working with, you know, it's, it's absolutely, you know, there, there's, they have the animal, the creature has to have agency and, and I have to have agency. There has to be that ability for us to communicate back and forth. I agree as well. And, um, uh, I'm trying to think, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Ah, that was a good question. It wasn't, it wasn't in my script. It would, had come up as something you had said, and now I can't remember what it is. Oh, well, it'll, it'll come, come back, back to you at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> You'll be like, texting Helen, me. we got to go back on live. <laughs> Listen, guys, if you have questions, let us know. Again, no question is off the table. Um, feel free to ask Helen. Um, I think it's great that we can provide these opportunities so that you can get to know our partners better. Um, what is their training methodology? What, uh, you know, what are their credentials? You know, do they do CEUs um, and continue their research and their learning? Um, you know, feel free to ask any of that uh, if you want, um, whether you've used Helen as a dog trainer or you've been to one of our programs. Um, I know we've got some great stuff coming up from Helen this month. We've got a great pop-up talk coming, and we also have an official club adventure at the end of the month called Superstar Seniors. I'm yeah. very excited for that. Can we take like a quick intermission here and get a, a snippet for you on what people can expect at uh that, oh just uh, for the adventure. oldies yeah. yeah well so we'll do uh um we're gonna do just like a, a senior day out senior dog day out and just have some fun giving senior dogs some enrichment and 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 give them the spotlight a little bit you know i think well you know that i know that a lot of senior dogs end up being left behind and sometimes senior dogs can't keep up with a lot of the big adventure things they get more tired more easily and all of that but um they still love to sometimes participate in that so what we'll be doing is all kinds of like confidence boosting some like showing how to modify certain things to to meet the senior dog's needs some nose work some cool tricks all that fun stuff Awesome. Looking forward to it. Um, and that as it, that is in Concord, guys, um, at No Monkey Business Dog Training. You can uh, sign up for that adventure on our website at goldendognh.com. Click on Adventures, and that is on the 30th. It's the day before Easter. So uh, fingers crossed that the weather will work with us. And that is for um, dogs seven years and over um, only, just to give, like uh, Helen said, Yay. those oldies a special day out. So we're looking forward to that. Awesome. So I'm curious, uh, what is your opinion on the future of dog training? You know, where are we headed in terms of methodology, particularly with regards to the ongoing shift towards more humane, positive reinforcement techniques? That's a great question. Um, 
where's the future of dog training? I mean, in, if, I mean, there's, there's two words, there's the two answers. There's the answer that I would say, like, if I had it my way, the future of dog training would be the continued movement of understanding that it is more about overall welfare and well-being than obedience. That's, that's what I would love people to focus more on. Okay. Um, <laughs> but is that going to happen? And I think that what's probably going to happen is that we're still going to see that movement in its own right, but there's always still going to be the noise on the opposite sides. You're going to have the noise of the, the, unfortunately, the people that still are using outdated techniques and outdated knowledge and studies um, and staying, being stuck in the mud that way. And then you're going to have a lot of extremists in all different in all different ways. Um, and that's that's what makes sometimes being a dog trainer in this industry very difficult is because you can feel like you really want to connect with other people. And, you know, this is a very diff high burnout career. It's very difficult with a lot of the work that we do. Um, but there's this element of like, well, if we don't share the same methodology in every single way, are we even get like, are you going to like chastise me? Can we get along? And so that's a very difficult thing too. So my, I would love the future of dog training to just get more cohesive as a unit together. And we're all in this together to help dogs. And, um, and then also to stop change, stop worrying so much about obedience and more about well-being and welfare on both ends of the leash. Yeah, agreed. Well said. I love that. So guys, we're starting to wrap up our conversation. So if you do have any questions you want to get in with Helen, um, pop them in for us now. Um, Bonnie has a question for you. She's wondering, what exactly do you consider aversive methods? Oh, and that's I think a that's great a great question because, yeah, we use that terminology all the time. But what exactly does it mean? Well, it depends on the dog. It totally depends on the dog. Like, I, the, Bonnie, it's such a great question. So you know, I give this example all the time when I'm talking to people about the four quadrants and, and you know, and, you know, when you say no. And, and again, you can go back to kids. You know, the way that I would draw a line in the sand with my my 13 year old Grace, who's highly sensitive and very anxious, is literally all I have to do is go Grace. And she's like, oh, my God. Like, I just say her name with Eve. I don't know. It's going to take a lot to, for me to even get close. And and honestly, we see this with dogs. Like my collie, my collies are so sensitive. And if they do something, you know, if I see them think like they'll walk past the kitchen counter and I just see that long nose kind of go, ooh, and I'll say, hey, Cordy. And he's like, oh, I shouldn't have been born. Like he just emotionally implodes, right? Whereas my Belgian I say to people, like, I could throw a grenade at him. I could literally probably throw a grenade at him. And he'd be like, I don't care. I'm still going to try and do it again. And some of that is just genetics. Like, we've bred some of these dogs to literally go after people firing guns. So they are going to have a much thicker skin for what they classify as an aversive to what, you know, another animal or dog might. And so it... It, an aversive for some dogs can be something as simple as raising your voice. Um, you know, and it's important that we understand that aversive doesn't mean abusive. There, there in no way, shape or form is there any, any room for any abuse. Abuse is suffering and, and not, um, uh, it's hard for me to add, but it, it, aversive does not mean abusive. Aversive is what the animal finds as something that they don't like, not something that they need to escape. Okay. So, so that's the way we have to look at it, but it really truly depends. Um, I mean, I've had some dogs that the collar that they're wearing is an aversive for them. They need to be on a harness or harness versus like, it's just totally dependent on the dog. Does that answer yeah. it? Okay, Tracy. Yeah, I think so too. And I'm glad you made that distinction between aversive and abusive because I think a lot of people think, oh, if I'm using an aversive training tool, am I abusing my dog? Or am I, you know, if I'm using an aversive method, as the question was asked, is that abu abusive? I want to better understand. So I'm glad you brought the question up, Bonnie, because again, it goes back to, you know, being open minded and asking those questions if you don't understand. Ask it of these trainers who have the certification, who have been in the 
business for many, many years. All of our um, dog training partners, they're highly vetted before we even bring them on as a partner. We want to make sure they're the best of the best. So we feel confident in the information they're giving to you as well. So ask these questions. You're not going to be judged by our community. You're not going to be judged by our partners. And if you are judged, I'm booting that person out of the community because we have to be open to having those conversations. It's just so important. So I'm glad you yeah, asked that Yeah, and I question, mean, Bonnie. the follow-up on that, Bonnie, you know, the aversive, if you're talking about using an aversive in a one-time situation, like if I raise my voice at my daughter who's about to run into the street, right, and I that's my way of stopping her, that's an aversive to, to interrupt and stop that behavior. But if I'm raising my voice at her all day long, right, even if that is not necessarily super aversive for her, but it's something that I'm doing all the time. Does that then categorize and start going into like an abuse situation where the, the creature is not able to escape this constant aversive, even if the aversive isn't that much of an, and, and I don't do that to my kids, but, and I'm not, but I, you give, get the example of what I'm trying to give here. So there, there's a, it's a really, really gray area. And that's where you have to have that conversation with your trainer and say, okay, you know, I I, I want to just ask this, what if, or how do I, or why, and get that out on the table. Yep, absolutely. That's great. And uh, I know that um, many of our members engage in dog sports as well. And I know sometimes the training tactics can be a little bit different there. Um, can you talk to kind of that industry and, and you, how you feel about the training methods there? Well, again, it depends because I, I love dog sports for so many dogs. The problem I have sometimes with dog sports, and honestly, this goes for anything, whether it's dog sports or just family dog, is expectation, is if you are putting, projecting an expectation on the dog for something that you want internally fulfilled with, and you lose sight of the fun that the animal should be having. That's where I I can see things can get muddled. And again, I see that not just in dog sports. I see that across the board, you know, um, you know, where no, my dog has to do this thing because doing this thing means that I am like, the, and it turns into that. But I actually think dog sports are fantastic. Um, I just honestly have so have always focused so much more on the behavior modification side of that stuff. So I just. I just farm it out to people who know what they're doing um, and stay in the realm of, of, of the same methodologies that I do of saying like, okay, well, the dog doesn't have to perform this perfect run or they're going to pay for it, if that makes sense. So I do think that in any arena of dogs, and quite frankly, in, in again, this parallels with kids, right, or anything, there is this very fine line of like, who am I doing this for? And that's where you have to keep your ego checked. And I, I've had to do that for myself um, in, in a lot of things. Am I doing this with my dog because he's enjoying it? Or am I doing it because I just want him to do it? And you got to always be asking yourself those questions. That's really an interesting question. And I, I want to reiterate that. So, you know, asking if you're doing this for yourself or asking if you're doing it for your dog. And it kind of seems to me like keeping up with the Joneses. Are you doing this to keep up with other people and you think this is what needs to be done? Or does your dog really enjoy this? And, I, you know, Helen, I don't know. Do What are some key ways you can really tell if your dog is enjoying a new activity that you're introducing them to? Well, they 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 don't leave going, thank God that's over. Right. I mean, some dogs will leave some of those things and be like, oh. not not tired, like happy, tired, like we are after we've had a good day. But like, thank God I really needed to get out of there. Right. Like that that to me is like that dog was just surviving in that moment, wasn't truly enjoying that experience. Um, and the, the hard thing is, is that sometimes it shifts. Like I see that all the time. Like we'll have puppies and young dogs that are loving this stuff. They're enjoying it. You know, they're great. And then they hit four or five and they're like, I'm all set. Thanks. I don't, I, but we're not ready to be done yet. It's like, no, no, no. I, I still am enjoying that. And so that's one sign avoidance, even when they're trying, you're trying to do something. If the dog's like, I just, I just kind of want to get out of here or I'm easily distracted. The thing with dogs that we have to, again, remember is that they are the most amazing forgiving creatures. You know, 
if we even go back in this conversation about all the aversive stuff that we have done to them in the, you know, decades and of hundreds and thousands of years of that we've had dogs, they still stick with us. Like we can do these things to these animals and they're still like, okay, you know, like whatever you need. And we have to be mindful of that, that just because my dog will do it for me doesn't mean that I should continue to be asking him to. Like that, I feel that way with horses. Yes, we can ride horses, but that's not what they were originally put on this earth for, right? And we we lose that perspective. Most of, of all creatures with dogs, we do sometimes do that with horses too. Um, so keeping that in check. Well, I think, you know, we do that with children too. We expose yeah. them to a lot of different things, you know, art and music and sports. And, you know, I had one son that absolutely loved baseball and, you know, followed it all the way through college and one son who did it for two years. And the second year he was, you know, picking daisies in the field. And he's like, this is so boring. I never want to do it again. Do we make him continue doing it because our first son loved it so much? No, of course not. We had to find something else that he ended up liking, which ended up being horse riding, which I never would have guessed. Um, but you don't know until you try all these different things. And I think, you know, that's one of the reasons we started this club is we wanted to give people additional opportunities to try new things with their dogs. Um, and as a reminder, we do have the Summer Olympics coming up this year, starting in July. And it will be another opportunity for you to get out and try different things that we don't normally offer. We'll have, you know, probably two dozen partners um, offering different opportunities to just try physical and, um, uh, activities and uh, mental activities. So keep an eye on uh, what's coming up with that. Helen, this has been a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate your time. Um, we had some great questions. And, um, you know, we'll keep the conversation going for sure. This started uh, in December and people have been great about being open minded and asking tough questions and being a part of the conversation. And I really appreciate our community for that. And I appreciate our partners for that. Um, you'll be able to access this. Um, I, my dogs are barking in the back, so I'm listening to that as I'm trying to think here. <laughs> You'll be able to access this on the replay. We will also put this in the member library so that you can find it easier. And if you haven't had a chance to yet, I do encourage uh, members to go to the library and watch the um, other dog training uh, panel discussion as well with our other partners. Just a lot of great information provided and some just some real um, conversation and a real look at where our dog training partners have come from, what they've learned, what they believe. Um, and I hope it's kind of helped guide you in your decision-making process as well. So thank you again, Helen, for your time. I'm always grateful to all of you for taking time out of your busy, busy days. Um, and we look forward to spending more time with you this month as our featured expert. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And, and again, any, if anybody ever has questions like that, that's, that's what we're here for. Um, and build that relationship with your trainer, you know, and the last part I will say is that dog trainers need reinforced positive reinforcement too, um, especially okay. nowadays. So, you know, um, always give us the benefit of the doubt and ask why, or come to us with a question. That's what we're here for. Most of us are very, very happy to give you all of that. And, and sometimes we just, we need a little cookie too, you know, to, to keep us going. So it's good to know. Well said. I agree. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Helen. Thanks everybody for joining us and uh, we'll see you at an adventure very soon. Have a great night. Bye.